Welcome home, brave heroes. I'm Ash, this is Ash Quest, and this is month two of Dungeon in a Box, the monthly subscription service where you get a 5e adventure across a 13 adventure campaign. And as of the time of recording this video, there is still a great deal for people new to this subscription service. This being month two, we're going to get something completely different. That's month one. Although I did notice that this box does look the exact same as the first box. So it does look like they are themed with the campaign details, not with the individual adventure details. And this is of course the campaign of the voyage of the fallen star. A quick note on shipping. This is the second box that I have received in the exact same manner just like this except with a clear plastic over it and the address label so everything's pretty much visible there's not any protection this box is basically the protection so while this is a lovely presented product this is just the shipping box basically each one of these boxes which arrives monthly at your door is a 5e adventure module these can be played standalone, or you can go ahead and link them into one 13-part campaign, which of course would take a year and a month to get all of the contents for with this subscription service. They come complete with 3D miniatures, 2D miniatures, or you know, the acrylic standees, the, the fig pin style minis, which while I was quite hesitant to like at first, I can kind of, I kind of get them. I kind of get it. I'm kind of okay with some of that. We'll see. We'll see going forward. I'm open to the idea. There, I, that's my summary as well as maps, full color, giant fold out poster sized maps, a 12 ish page adventure book and cardboard tiles that you can punch out and assemble into sometimes 3D terrain. Well, that was the case with the last box. So let's see what's in this box. Open up the front and we are presented with our first look at the second month's adventure. Now, I don't know if I received this adventure because this one in particular is supposed to be sent for the second month every single time. So like if you subscribe in November, you'd get the adventure that we unboxed last time and this would be the one that you get in December. Or if the 13 part campaign is basically built to be played in any order and you can just go ahead and subscribe and you'll just get whatever the box is for that month. I'm inclined to believe that it's the former since it's a 13 part campaign, but maybe for that 13th month, they flag those special subscribers who've gotten the other 12 months and they go ahead and send them the special secret 13th month. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If you know, let me know in the comments below. But the first thing we're presented with is the 3D minis. The last one came with two. This one comes with two. There is a subscription service, I believe, on the Dungeon in a Box website because there are actually multiple different kinds of subs you can get there. The uh, monthly module is one. Wondrous One Shots is another. And I think there's one that allows you to just receive two minis in the mail in a box. And I think that they're probably these minis. So the mini that comes with the dungeon in a box modules should be available as part of that service and we'll maybe look into whether that's worth it or not also but this is a tidal knight and we'll go ahead and unbox him within the caves behind the tide pools he has furnished chambers with baubles and flotsam salvaged from the sea festooning the walls festooning that's a new word for me with broken jewelry, damaged artworks, and waterlogged books, everything else he owns he has made for himself from the bounty of the island. I like that, and I like this guy instantly better than the Puss in Boots character from the last module. A very silly looking tabaxi. This is a pretty silly concept also, don't get me wrong. A tidal knight. He looks more ninja-esque in his stance and his weapon of choice? I guess not, actually. It's the way he's drawing the sword, but it is very much more a Western sword. This guy is strong. He's developed powerful legs from all that swimming. Look at this, what is this, horseshoe crab? And each shell that he's wearing as a shell, as a shield on his back? What does he do with this thing? It's awesome. Oh, and the tail is loose. You can actually move it around. I don't know if that matters for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I like it. I'm a fan of that. I'm a fan of that. Will it hero quest? Not really. You'd have to really do some kit bashing. Uh, the base, of course, sitting down on my one inch grid, it encroaches into the other tiles. We know this from the last episode. This magma wolf, just like the last month's box where the dragon bone, dragon skull hermit crab was the mini that just stole the show from me. This wolf 
is fantastic. This is so awesome. So inflamed, it managed at last to surround and devour the spirit of water completely. The new elemental became a creature of magma and rage, tormented by a body that perpetually forms, hardens, shatters, and reforms with every movement. That's the description from the Roar of the Blazing Isles, which I think is the module that we are going to be digging into, but not before we destroy that box to get this guy out. This mini, I don't care if the base is round. This is going to go into a contemporary hero quest game. This is a fantastic mini. If I get rid of all the rest of my dungeon in a box contents because I'm just not going to play the, the modules or whatever, the giant minis I'm certainly keeping. He looks great. And these guys aren't like 3D printed either. They're, they're, they're injection molded. They're made of a great material. There's not, there's not any risk of breaking when you drop these guys. Anyways, you want to see this guy, I've got an, another video you can check out for that. Let's get into the rest of this box and see what we find. So I've got all kinds of trash up here now. This box is empty, so I'm just going to go ahead, use it to collect my trash. Once upon a time, I thought I would want to collect these boxes, but since they're all the same box, there's no need. This can now be recycled. Now, we have in our possession from month one a board on which we can put stickers. And so the fragment of natural harmony, this is one of the things that goes onto the board. It looks like with each month, you're gonna get a bunch of little stickers and the board that comes with your first month subscription uh, package, these stickers go on that board to kind of represent the progress that you've made throughout the overall campaign. This is one of the gems that gets filled in on that board. So you unstick this, and place it onto the board whenever you earn the gem in the campaign. The Fragment of Natural Harmony, which is what this is, is a character with the compass can take an action to detect poison and disease or locate animals or plants as the spell at will. Unlike the spell, the character must expend an action each round to maintain the effect. So you get a little bit of a new utility. Then we've got rooms that we can also unstick and place onto our ship. And I believe this means the ship will slowly get filled with more and more stuff. Now, whether you choose one of these or the other, or you can have both, I don't know. But this is a pretty novel concept. I like the idea of it because it, it makes it into a sort of legacy game. It changes as you play permanently. And there's no way to really go back and erase the stickers that you've placed onto your ship. While you can maintain a separate log for replayability and branching paths and stuff, it makes the game more yours. So we've got the Steam Spirit Housing sticker, 2x2 two two tile, and the Sea Urchin Tank sticker. And those are the stickers that come with this module. Probably one of the, the least importance you want to get right to the minis, maps, and tiles and such. But I just want to show you this stuff before we get into that. The Spirit of Elemental Steam and the Infernus Urchin Pool, two cards that come with the, the stickers here. This box was prepped and checked by a feisty grung, no doubt referring to a very specific employee at the time this was put together. I love that. And then we've got the skinny minis and another set of acrylic stands. So we'll go ahead and look at these. You're always going to get a 2D version of your 3D miniatures. So here's our magma wolf. Here is a really cool, really rotted looking beholder. This is a single stalactite. And I think it is hilarious that it has been created, that it exists at all. Looks like there's an eye in this stalactite. There might be some feet or a teeth. This might be actually just be a monster disguising itself as a stalactite so it can jump down onto uh, unwary adventures. But this is going to go into one of these bases and actually be on the board. And it's going to look like it's just suspended in air. But if your uh, theater of the mind skills are good, you'll, your adventurers will think this is a stalactite, I suppose. We have some fire bats. I love this type of enemy. They're in every video game ever. We have some sort of will-of-the-wisp creature. And we've got whatever the heck this thing is. It looks like the stalactite again, but now it's on the ground. Oh, it, it is. It is. It's the stalagmite version of that monster. We've got to flip this over to get these other people. We've got whatever the heck this thing is. Looks like more living mountain. A person with an axe. And then the horseshoe crab-backed tidal knight that we saw before. Then, I actually flipped that prematurely. We've got a lovely drow elf or underdark elf of some variety. I'm pretty sure this is all officially using the OSR, so probably drow. And then this guy with his horn, big boy blue. 
we could snap these out and see what they look like on the standees. I'll do that at the end of the video. I'm not gonna waste anybody's time doing it right now. This is the roar of the Blazing Isles, part of the Voyage of the Fallen Star campaign. And if I cared to really dig into the book, I might get the answer to my questions earlier about the order in which these must canonically be played, but I'm not too worried about it. Oh yeah, this is Adventure 2. No matter what, no matter what month you start on, you're gonna get Adventure 1. And this will be the adventure that you get in your second month of subscribing. But it does say that you are holding a complete adventure that you can either play by itself or as part of the ongoing Voyage of the Fallen Star adventure arc. So this adventure will take your characters from level 2 to level 3 as they explore volcanic islands for a fragment of the Fallen Star. If not, you can still use this book to run perilous volcano encounters in your own game world. So we get access to stat blocks for the Link Acolyte, belongs to the Iron Chain, Gang of Elves, Ship Rolls, Captain, Lookout, Carpenter, Cook, Doctor, Navigator, Black Rift Vessels, Combat at Sea, Being Captured, Landing Party, Escaped Prisoners, The Blazing Isles, and The Drow, Beliar's Heatstones, Origin of the Isles, Terrain Encounters, Map Features, The Lichen Jungle, The Clouded Cavern. These are going to correspond with the maps that we got, and we're going to go ahead and unbox those maps now. By the way, the Magma Wolf has 68 hit points, 8d10 plus 24. You get 700 experience for destroying it. Fantastic. All right, we're running out of room. Let's unfold the nefariously folded maps first and yeah you're getting pretty much pretty much the entire map here a little bit of glare from the light it's not that bad it's not that bad in an actual setting the lights i have all over are are too much you're not going to use as much light for a normal game but we have cave we have lots of cave we have doors in cave we have magma in cave this is likely a great spot to be fighting the magma wolf we have room with glowing flora in cave we have curved walls built in cave we have natural rooms in cave jesse james hideout room we have foggy room in cave or steam room perhaps actually probably and more magma high utility this map does not have but what's on the opposite side we've got a lovely beach lovely beach map with a little bit of a stream, natural land bridge, I suppose. And then we go again into cave. And the cave really blocks off a lot more spaces than it allows access to. Uh, we've got a very thin passage here. So interesting feature right there. The passage is not a tile. You can see through it, but you can't walk through it. You might be able to do some challenges to squeeze through it. As with last month's box, I'm not gonna use the map for anything. I just don't see it as having enough utility for what I like to play and how I like to play things. I'm, I'm gonna leave the map alone, but it'll be a perfect complement to the official roar of the Blazing Isles campaign. This is the part after the minis that I'm most excited about, and that's the tiles. In the last adventure, we had a bunch of stuff that snapped together to create terrain, and this is gonna be no exception, it looks like. So, without further ado, listen as I unclick these from their cardboard trappings. Just looking at these, I can tell that they are going to be rocks that fit onto each other. So we've got rock B, let's call it, whoops, rock B and rock A, and they'll have opposite slits, but they'll just slide right onto each other to form a rock formation that stands up by itself in your dungeon. I know I'm gonna sound like a real complainer. This isn't really my favorite way to represent terrain on a board, these cross shapes. So you could tell I've never really played a lot of theater of the mind. Uh, type stuff where this stuff shouldn't even matter. It's just any sort of visual aid you get at all. It's just something for which you should be thankful. Playing more of the very visual hands-on board games, it is harder to see this as useful for the homebrew, uh, for the type of game that I enjoy playing. But that isn't to say that it's without its worth. You can definitely use this stuff and you might not be as picky as I am and think that this is a perfectly fine thing to have for say your hero quest games. After all, it is a serviceable 
giant rocky wall that's blocking the path of your heroes. So please don't let my attitude sour your fun. We also have tall block. Um, so just a pedestal, really. It, it It's a wall. I suppose it should function as a wall. I think we'll get to a point in the um, instructions in the book where we can confirm that. But I'm not 100% sure that I like the straight up cube formations of these. We've got different heights here. So maybe, maybe we're really looking at two pieces of a greater picture, which we'll get to seeing here before too long. More cave formations. With all of them removed, we've got these larger cave sections, which I think are going to look really cool. And I do believe that's how these are used. These slide on to these bad boys. Now we have freestanding larger cave wall sections. Yet another, this one has extra large holes in it. So perhaps our heroes can either look through this and be able to target enemies from afar, or they should even be able to crawl through these holes if they pass certain checks. Perhaps they'll be able to do it for free. And we've got lots of cave wall terrain now to play with. Two more free standing rock formations in the cave. And now I have a total of three of these rock formations. And I noticed that we get these things, these sort of coral-esque creatures. And they have cross-shaped punch outs in the center, which means that they go right over the top of these rock formations, resulting in this abomination. What is this exactly? I don't know. We're going to find out pretty quick here. No other instructions or anything like that. We end up with our map, our legacy stickers, as they are called, our terrain, two large cave walls, three sort of blockade cave pieces, rock pieces, and three rock formations with these crazy urchins on top. No doubt they will make themselves known in the story. I've got some acrylic standees, skinny minis, as I suppose I'm supposed to be calling them. I don't actually at this exact moment know if that's like a proprietary term or if I can just use it to refer to all acrylic miniatures. But this is the entire package right here for your second month of Dungeon in a Box. This is, as of the time of recording this video, still heavily discounted. It doesn't look like it's as discounted as it was when I signed up. Uh, the third month is actually going to be regular price. So next month's unboxing will actually be the last one. I'll show you month three of Dungeon in a Box, but at full price, it's 36 USD. I was mistaken about the full price in the last video. For some reason, I thought this was like 15 or $20 but the discount was actually 70% off when I paid for it and free shipping. So each box was only maybe 749 USD. This box being 749 USD is beyond worth it. It is so, so worth it. Worth it just for the wolf miniature here, just about, I would say. You would definitely expect to pay about that much for this wolf if you were going to be buying a version of it from Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures, whatever that D&D WizKids brand of minis is that I can't stand because they're too small and they lack detail. This wolf is superior to those. And that might be a bold claim, but I am making it. These sculpts are superior to those sculpts for sure. The cardboard, I'm not so sure about. I like the utility of cardboard stuff that you can build and place in your maps in just about anything. I don't know how useful you will find these. I don't know how immersive you will find these pieces, how helpful you will find them to being immersive for your players in your campaign. That is subjective. That's totally your call. A comment in the last video remarked on the art style of these characters uh, for the last module, which were like zombie pirates. They were a little bit too cartoony. They weren't exactly serious. This is a very, very colorful cast of characters. There's just colors popping everywhere. Bright reds, bright blues, purples, drow skin. It's all here. So the aesthetic overall may not be quite what you're looking for as well. But I am here to comment on the quality of the materials, and the quality is top-notch. These cardboard pieces are sturdy, it's thick, the miniatures are just great, they're top tier for me. Your book is great condition, this little 6x9 will fit comfortably with whatever other 6x9 campaign books you might have to give you infinite inspiration. The acrylic miniatures I don't have a problem with, I don't have anything to really compare them against for quality, but I mean I'm sure that they are absolutely great, they're just fine. And I will say, if we take out one, 
place it on a base so we can get a good look at how it looks when it's in its 3D form. I have to make the comment again that one thing I really like about these is that since they have clear bases, you can see through the base to the floor of the terrain, and that's more immersive than having a solid base. Even if it's a solid base that's been decorated and has like little plants and rock and stuff on it, that monster is now going to be kind of confined mentally to be in an area that has that kind of floor. The monsters that have clear bases in a game type like this, they can be used anywhere at all and they won't break the immersion whatsoever, except for the fact that they're 2D and as soon as they turn 90 degrees, you can't see them anymore, they're invisible. You, you'll miss them completely, both figuratively and literally. You'll sit at the board and you'll forget that they're there and then your character will roll to attack them, but they won't be able to because this, how are you going to attack this? You'd need to be like a master archer or an expert swordsman. All right, enough about that. I do want to check out this stalactite as well. I've just got to know, I've got to know what this looks like in its stand. There it is, there it is. Here it is. Here is a skeleton from Hero Quest, Prophecy of Talor, and it, you know what? It fits. If these were just like regular stalactites, they'd fit just fine. They take up a tile though, is the problem. So you wouldn't be able to move, maneuver yourself directly under them. You'd kind of be able to share the tile, but you know, we're not really about that. That's a bit too weird. This is a little too personal. So I wouldn't use them as regular stalactites, but given that they are monsters, I don't think they're supposed to be regular stalactites anyway. What I would have loved to have seen would be like a cave that you can place together that your characters can go into or stand on top of. And that's pretty much it. I hope that you'll let me know what you think about all of this. I just realized this, this could be actually stood up kind of like this. After the awesome miniature here, the Magma Wolf, my favorite thing about this are the mechanics talking about sailing, getting to know your ship, crew sailing checks. This is all stuff that you can incorporate into your tabletop dungeon crawler board games for between quest events. Getting onto a ship and having a book full of useful sailing events and having different methods to pass checks in order to determine the outcome of these different events that happen while you're at sea could be super useful for some campaigns. But anyway, guys, I hope you found this unboxing and presentation useful. I have one more to go next month, so we'll see how that goes. And depending on how that goes, perhaps I'll be convinced to resubscribe to Dungeon in a Box. But either way, I look forward to checking that out. And I really would like to check out the Wondrous One Shots and their miniature subscription service in the future as well, even if for only a month or two. So comment anything you'd like down below. I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching and have a fantastic rest of your day. Onward, brave heroes.